So that's what it's all about. So that's the scale of the drawing that you saw on a bigger scale repeats at this scale of the movement of people. So it's actually a public space, a building becoming a small city at the scale of the building. Just in terms of the previous talk, talks, both of them, uh, what I've always appreciated in my contact with, with India and the fraternity of architects here is the skill to, to distill things and to be storytellers and to, to communicate things in a very simple, accessible manner. Um, so the term minimalism in my context is actually reducing complex things to the essence. Um, so the project that I'll be showing today as an as a example of my work Coincidentally, after I was invited through Professor Balsawa, uh, we were shortlisted for the World Architecture Festival um, in the educational category. Um, so the, the, the project is really uh, a small demonstration of our work, uh, small practice with three, four people. Um, and we share that sim similar culture of we, when you get a project, you do it properly and you do it with a sense of wonder and you, uh, you can immerse yourself in the meaning of that. Um, and that sense of wonder around building uh, is something that is something to hold on to as a student of architecture too. It's one of the things that I find as an architect, the older you get, the, the longer you've been involved in architecture, the more fascinating it becomes. So the thing about reflective practice, comparing your work, my work in South Africa to what I've seen happening in India, lots of parallels, but there's always more to learn and to absorb. Um, my first visit to India was more than 20 years ago. It was in Goa. I saw Correa's work then, was inspired by it usually, uh, usually inspired by it. I went back to South Africa and used those lessons in one of my first buildings at business school. So I'm not going to dwell on that. I'll, I'll leap into the presentation um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about Correa and influence where I can in the middle because I think that's part of the, the context of my visit is the legacy of, of Correa. Okay, so can I um, move to that? Okay, so this is, the, this is the, the team working, and it's the way we work. We hated COVID. Uh, we work very actively with models and drawings. It's a very analog way of working, um, and we redo things. We craft, uh, and I've used the word craft, and people say, what's the difference between craft and design? I think it's very specific in terms of understanding material. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that have gone, I think, missing in architecture because of the, the digital age there the actual tactile quality. So that the bowling is actually the one that I'm going to be focusing on, that one that you saw there. Just in terms of, of um, where the bowling is located, uh, this is South Africa, obviously, on the continent. Uh, and there's a city called, called, it's actually a town, they call it a city because it's the capital of one of the states in South Africa, uh, Kimberley. It's known for the discovery of diamonds. Um, so there was the big diamond rush. And it, but it's a very remote city uh, in, the, in the greater context. So once the diamond rush was over, the interest sort of dissipated in terms of that town and it went into decline. But just in terms of, of your understanding of climate and context and sustainability issues, uh, if you look at this image, it sits in that area of South Africa, which is comparable to your Rajasthan in India, hot, dry climate. So we've got those parallels. But we, I, we, I've been talking to quite a few people yesterday at a wonderful dinner um, uh, out um, on, on, uh, on a farm outside Pune um, about these climate uh, zones being very similar. We've got sub, a subtropical zone which sits there, which is where Durban is. Uh, then you've got the high felt there, which is moderate, which is like Bangalore. Then you've got the, the dry zone there with, with a lot of sun, and then you've got a Mediterranean, Mediterranean zone, which you don't have. But So the similarities are, are quite substantial, and when I work across these areas, my design changed quite a bit. Um, and I'm not from Cape Town, I'm based there now. I, I studied and grew up in that part and that part. So I know the country quite well, and my work has been scattered all over um, South Africa. Just again, in terms of the population, few people in that location. So this is the density mapping really of South Africa, of where the urban populations are. And 
those of you that of you that follow cricket, the Wanderers is there in Johannesburg. Then there's Kingsmead in Durban, Jaunty Roads, and then there's the, the Newlands in, in Cape Town. Uh, that is what we've got that sort of <laughs> legacy in common. Um, so if you look at the rain, very little rain, just to give you some more context in that zone where the building is, and then the extremes of, of, of climate, hot days and very cold nights, and you have to, you have to negotiate back between those, those two extremes. So I can't go into the detail, but you can see the seasons there and, and, and the rain. It's not humid at all, it's actually hot and dry, the climate. Um, and so if you look at, if, if, you, if you add those up, how would you design it? You've got lots of sun, little rain, few plants, few people. So that is actually the, the context. Again, very simple concepts to work with, not very theoretical. And that's what the landscape looks like. So you can see, I mean, if, if I had to ask you, how would you explain this terrain? You'd say hot, dry, no trees, few people. Is exactly what the photo says. So if a town gets established here, what would that response be if you didn't have all these influences that come into architecture that we con constantly get bombarded with? And again, just going back to the legacy of, of Korea that people mentioned before, the reflectiveness and the, and, the, and the sort of reverting back to the past. And what would the vernacular be? What would the original response be with the local use of the local, local materials? In that context, this is it. So if you go to the Northern Cape, you will find these structures, and you can almost imagine it's the, the sort of climate where very scarce resources, you spend a lot of your time outside the structure. It's so hot that you want to escape into this thing. It's the inverse of an igloo, um, which you'd find in the, on the North Pole, so it becomes the inverse. And so it's cool inside, and, and these thick walls. And that's a very nice metaphor to work with as an architect. And how do you build in a contemporary fashion with what's available today and the skills available in that context? And also in this heat, if it's really hot, you go and sit in the shadow on the other side. If it's a cold winter morning, you sit against this wall with heat from the previous day radiating out from the wall. So the use of mass is something, again, that I think we've got in common the way we build in South Africa to the way that you, will, you, you build in India. You work with the solid and the void, as Nandan just mentioned. So that, that is a very sort of specific way of, of approaching it. And yet you can see a, a later development, but also this is a sort of a, a stone construction um, in that context. So if I had to simplify it in a, in a Charles Perea manner, I suppose, you would say thick walls, cool inside, shade outside, and, that's, and small openings. The smaller those openings, the better. So you actually just escape the severe um, uh, extreme conditions. It's not the way people build in South Africa today, because what we have are, are building regulations, and architects tend to just conform to the minimum that's required in terms of the regulations. So they will build the minimum thickness of the wall. And then we get back to Louis Kahn and his statement, what does the wall want to be? So that mass becomes a, 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 a principle that we start off with. This is just a, a, an image of a collection of, of other projects that, that I've been involved with throughout my career and the sort of consciousness of light, but also, uh, if one uses the term minimalist, it's not, everything is not pristine white, it's just, again, reductive, the essence, and then the, and the very conscious use of light in, in these projects. Uh, this, is, uh, this is in Kimberley and Laurie Baker, those openings, you may recognize them, it's like a stencil actually cast onto that wall, so the influence has also been through Baker. This is a, I'm specifically including this slide, because it, de it deals with the principle of imperfection, and again, if you work in a developing world country, you can't polish everything. You can't keep on polishing everything every week um, in use. You have to design for the, um, it has to be rigorous. And in fact, these buildings like the ashram that uh, Nandan showed just earlier, it just becomes more beautiful with time. If you visit the Le Corbusier building in, in France, it just gets nicer in time. So you can see these sort of qualities now on the building. It's a detail. I'm starting with a detail, but you can see the brickwork, the concrete work, and the imperfection there um, in, in a sort of a detail within the building. Before I go into uh, zoom out again, everybody rushed into Kimberley at some point with the discovery of diamonds, and they dug this massive hole which you may have seen. And as you can see, you can, if you want to, you can move the Chrysler building in there. Um, so. Um, 
But it's amazing what happened there. From 1870 to 1924, they dug a hole which is 240 meters deep, essentially people with their hands, in this mad rush for, for diamonds uh, in the time of Cecil John Rhodes. Um, and that's, that's what it looked like. And it's quite amazing as an architect to look at an image like that, the cubism, the shadow and light. What is actually possible in architecture through people's own involvement with their hands in digging these holes? And the reason why it's got these abstract forms, because everybody had a, a square uh, patch that they were allocated. It's like a claim. And so everybody, you see some people went further down. So Nandan is up there. It takes eight, eight years, sorry. And somebody else takes much longer. Uh, so that you can see the speed at which people dig. Almost the level of greed, I suppose, to get to, get to the diamonds. Uh, and then they ended up with a massive hole. But what I then said as a concept, it's a bit like the scale concept that Sachin spoke about earlier, a very simple concept. Why don't we build in a way where we take the earth and carve exactly like they did with, with the big hole? How do we do that with buildings? Um, so, and that is city building. It's the void again. So you take that solid, cut back into it. What are those possibilities for an architect to work with? And uh, we take that, uh, our practice takes that seriously as a, as a point of departure. So you look at that hole there. Lots of development then happened around it in 1937. So the focus of development was there, and then you, you got the car. So that was the rush to 2010, fairly dense. Then it became this dissipated, almost American-style environment. And so what happened with, with a competition for a new campus, they said, let's try and reverse it. And so they, they identified a piece of land, and there was an urban design framework done. We didn't do the framework. There was a competition, and we got involved in... Buildings, so I'm going to be focusing on that building. So you can see how that mass becomes the, the context of doing a new building, which is a really nice opportunity for us to work in something that we believe in as, as urban designer architects. So the context is then there, linked to that system, and in future, sorry, this is going a bit fast. Um, so that's the incremental development of the campus itself. And you can see the buildings going from 2013 as a process. Okay, and then you see the building in its context. So what you do is respond to the town or the city and you respond to the figure ground or the figure of the buildings that are developed around your um, building that you're involved with. So by the time we did our buildings, most of the other, other buildings had been established and some of them are still to come. So you, you can work in a very responsive way within, within a framework. Okay, so stereotomic, the, the term that we use for working with a solid, is so, so you start with a mass, and then you, you sort of fashion that that's related to the, to the vernaculars. And you see that model then um, developing. And, and the, the sun is very big, disproportionately big in the image, because that's the reality. You try to hide from that thing hanging in the sky there, in, in the way that you design the buildings. It's almost North African as well. This drawing, I collated all the plans of the other architects' buildings and did this noise map type drawing. And it shows our building is actually just part of a group of buildings. It's not more important than those buildings. It's all about the collective. And how do you support the collective in the way you design? So that's the frame of the clay that's been carved out. And then you see the footprint of the building we designed. And it's really about that responsiveness. And again, very simple concepts in terms of how you work. It's not very really theoretical. It's just the form response, and you work with the, with the climate. Okay, so you see the, the building there. Uh, inside that building, it's, uh, it's an auditorium building on the lower levels, and then there's a sort of um, office space at the top. But it was, it's interesting that the framework, the form that we were given, was in a way sacrosanct. We were told we have to fit the functions into it, and if, if it didn't fit, they would put those functions somewhere else. So it's the inverse of, a, of how buildings are often built, where the brief is developed by a client and you do your utmost to fit everything in the building. So it was quite forgiving in that instance because the framework and the development of the campus was the important thing. The sacrosanct thing was the whole system. And every piece actually then fits into that, into that total system. And ultimately, this is what the campus is about. It's this life between classes. How do you move between classes? And how does every building support that? And it, it starts showing for instance, on this image where the auditoriums are, where the gathering spaces, the main square, and how this building be becomes part of a sequence 
of, of scalar hierarchies, where you zoom in, you zoom out. You're always conscious about movement on the larger campus. And so the essence of this is, um, and we get to the form response. Um, and I also think that good design seems as if it's effortless, um, precisely because it was a lot of effort to distill and bring it back to its, uh, its, its simplicity. Uh, but also the way that we communicate, and this is for the, as I said, for the World Architecture Festival, you actually build models sometimes to communicate things for a specific purpose. So in a way, we've been reflecting on our work by building models post-completion. So this model was built done post-completion, after all the mess and refinement of what happened in the studio during a very, a very long period of, of designing the building. So you can see that, uh, again, in context. And you could, what's interesting about the image on the right here is that this was a very early uh, model built by the different architects coming to a meeting in Kimberley with their first ideas. So the, this is, you can see the framework below, and you can see all the different architects arriving there with their one to 200 scale models. So the debate was from the first day about the collective, not about the individual building. And then in terms of developing the buildings, you can see how these models are iterations starting with something like that. But we do these things regardless. We, we're not rushing towards a, a, a presentation. It's the, it's the enjoyment of working with proportion, scale, movement, and all that. So, so the craft for us sits, sits in this, um, working with that solid. And, and also then obviously in terms of structure, uh, this is the engineer. Uh, in terms of, of the structure in that, and that's for us hugely sort of enjoyable part of the design process. So if you look at that, again, you've got the solid, and you can almost imagine how would you carve into that solid, hard landscape in a way that they built that, or they dug that big hole um, in Kimberley over time. So this is on the, on the roof of our building with my assistant. Um, and then what we did is we built this model to show how you actually would then unpack it. And I also believe in uh, that good architecture is very difficult to photograph. You have to experience it. Uh, so the best you can do to understand buildings are to build models like these. And again, as I say, these are post-rationalized models. But you can see that how the form actually is sort of deconstructed to try and explain what happens inside a very complex um, interior. So if you look at the plans, um, Le Khan's exploration of servant and servant spaces, that's what this is about. So you can see the dock is the servant spa servants and that's the served space and how that sort of whole thing hangs together. So that, I mean, they're, they're obviously then there are services in those spaces, yeah. And fitting the auditorium into a triangle was quite tricky. Usually you would like that to be like this space. And so you can see how the shift creates tensions in the plan but also opportunities. Um, so you see there the auditorium sitting there, and these then become the semi-public spaces in there, but they're linked um, to, to the public spaces outside. So you go from public to semi-public to semi-private to private at the top, so you've got four layers um, in that sequence going up. Okay, so I'm just going to take you through a quick walk. This is the main square, which is now completed. And you've now seen the framework, and you can see, well, this is amazing how the space has actually been used now by people. Talking about pedestrians coming back into it. There's not a single car on campus. It's not built for, for cars. And then you can see our building appearing there. And you'll see the influence there of Khan in that work, and Korea, and the in influences that I picked up in India many, many years ago is actually vested in the building. So you come down that spine, a different time of day, appearing on the, on the left there. You start looking at this sort of portal in there. And we call the, this building a, a cool cave. It's like those other images. It's cool, sort of cut out void space. Looking back. This was taken in COVID, so that's why there are no people there. <clears throat> but the hierarchy of space, and you've now picked it up on the model, and in a way the model should... This is a video. Um, this is the next one. Yeah, this is a video. Can we play the video? I was just asked to indicate. These doors 
can open at, at times, so that transparency, but you'll see students now moving through it, and they go into the auditorium um, in that fashion, the fashion in there. And the construction, that's the small door, you can see that there. A bit of a, this is a more recent photograph, that's where you enter the building. It's a bit like the Frank Floyd Frank Wright principle too. You, you pinch it and you close it down and then you open it up again. This is at the back of the building. The opening is on the, on the uh, uh, western facade of the building, which is a very sort of sun-exposed facade. And the cutouts to bring the light in. You can see the thick walls there. That's the cool cave. So we've cut open the model there, and you can see the sequence of space on the model going from the outside to the foyer space to the auditorium space. So they're all interlocked into a sequence of spaces that we, that we crafted. And we worked on this project just for interest. We worked on this project probably for eight years because we were asked to do another building first, and some people would have seen the other building, much bigger building, and they put this building, like building on hold. And it was one of those joys. It's like a car, kind of scarpa type opportunity. You've got eight years to craft something. Um, and it's, uh, in terms of my career, by far the most sort of um, time we've had to do any building. Um, so you see that space on the inside. You, you will now recognize from the photographs. Um, and that's the stair going up into the auditorium there. And then the indirect use of light coming in from, from the top and into that um, semi, semi private space. That's now through the auditorium. And these pockets are bringing light in, you can see on all the sides. Okay, this is a video, can you play this one? Okay, that's fine, we can move on. So that's what it's all about. So that's the scale of the drawing that you saw on a bigger scale, repeats at this scale of the movement of people. So it's actually a public space. It, uh, a building becoming a small city at the scale of the building. And the introduction of the, the yellow, you'll see that coming into play now, which is part of the history of the tram system that served the mines. So the yellow appears in the sequence of spaces. And you can also see the imperfection that I spoke about earlier on the surfaces, surfaces and the indirect use of natural light. So you're looking up into that void space now. That's a very narrow slot cut there, and you can see the effect of that as the sun moves over from east to west. That's always changing. So the sun comes, you see those openings on that facade. This is the effect of the light, the indirect light bouncing into it like that. It's such a joy to work with light. As something that one can just become more and more proficient with over time um, if you're aware of that ability uh, to work with light and debate it in the office, test it with models as we do. So I'm just flashing through because there's another, uh, this is a shutter that opens to bring in light. So if it's, if, if there's a, there are power cuts, you can open the shutter and you can bring in the light that comes through that opening. And you can see that opening there. And this is then um, able, able to open and close it. Okay, next one. 
F four. Sorry, it's hanging a bit. So that's that space. Again, it's very simple. It's very straightforward, uh, unpretentious. And that's where the term in our framework, minimalism, comes in. And then you go up into the spaces at the top there. Where the offices are. So this is for the World Architecture Festival. There's just one um, video I want to show of one house that we did and they did and they're not done, um, which is a um, fairly well published house. Um, which is in the Western Cape. So this is the white architecture of the Mediterranean zone. Um, and it's quite a nice video done recently for a television program. Um, it shows that um, it's almost a, a villa uh, sitting in the, in the landscape. But it's the same principles of a very sort of tightly controlled box with light coming into it. Um, and so it's the, the, the focus in this case is out. The house that you visited last night is also like that. So you, it's like an aperture that you sit in uh, and you enjoy the views from there. This is a magnificent landscape that we live in, in the Western Cape. Um, and so to be given a site like this to, to work on is just incredible, um, to work with that context and the tension uh, of the two hills in this case that anchors the, anchors the house. And then, as I said earlier, in time it just becomes better because of the landscape invading it. It becomes like a ruin. Um, and much of it for us is in that too, that you, you, you're not precious about the architecture, you allow the landscape to invade it. But um, the purpose I showed this is that it's consistent whether you work on a house for a single client or, you, or whether you work on a campus building, those same principles apply. And it's also like the small city because there's an avenue and access running through the house in the middle of it. And that becomes the primary ordering device and inside the volumes change. And it's very much like Correa in that sense. Very simple order, but very, very complex internal arrangement of, of spaces. Okay, so thank you very much. I um, hope it did justice to um, coming all the way to India and the huge privilege of being here. Um, I'm here for another three weeks. I really look forward or, or so um, to many acquaintances and discussions. Thanks a lot for the organizers again.